Hello, everyone. Welcome to Demo Day 2017. My name is Sarah Yates. And I'm Rob Moore. Over the past year, we have had the pleasure of serving as Launch's co-chairs. And tonight, we have the privilege of welcoming you to watch all of our teams pitch. Tonight is the culmination of three months of incredibly hard work by the teams in our launch cohort. As you'll see, these teams come from incredibly diverse industries, from med tech, to food, to waste management, to education, and more. But what unites all of them is the collective commitment they have to radically refining and improving their business propositions through the launch curriculum. And after seeing all of our teams launch this morning, I can guarantee that their commitment has paid off and they have become incredible businesses over the course of the past three months. Launch exists to increase our startup's chances of long-term success. Way back in December, we selected some of the most promising startups from across the UC system uh, to come here and enter our three-month program, which we kicked off in, uh, way back in February. Over the last three months, they spent 50 hours with our faculty go, working through Berkeley's Lean Launchpad methodology. They've got out of the building, they've conducted over 800 customer interviews uh, to refine their business model and find product market fit. What you'll see tonight is the culmination of all their, uh, of hundreds of hours of hard work and our startup founder's native ingenuity. But the time that's gone into launch is not only the time of our hardworking team members. It also comes from the work of launch mentors, who are industry experts who come alongside our teams to guide them every step of the way. It also is the hard work of our faculty members, who put in over 50 hours of curriculum teaching, as well as hundreds of hours of office hours dedicated to working with our teams. And especially, we're here tonight because of the support of our partners and sponsors. These partners are not only financial supporters of launch, many of them long term, but they are also industry experts themselves. And they dedicate their time to come coach our launch teams in everything from how to build an excellent financial model to what's going through a VC's head when they're watching the team pitch. I particularly want to highlight a couple of our very long-term supporters who are here tonight. Javelin Ventures has been supporting Launch for 10 years as of this year, and we actually have a representative. <laughs> we actually have a representative from Javelin on our judging panel. Marpe Accounting is also a company that has spent a lot of time coming and coaching Launch teams and helping them think through how to handle their finances effectively before they're ready to hire their first CFO. I also want to call out a few of our, oh yes. <laughs> we'll go into more depth about our sponsors later on, but I do want to thank them right, right here, right up front, while we still have your attention. So Goodwin is another sponsor for us. Tube Mogul, which has recently joined with Adobe. Javelin, as I already mentioned, Marpe. Be Partners, <laughs> Dow, the NSF I-Core, Pair VC, Trinet, and Plug and Play Ventures. So let's all, let's all give them a thank you. Also, we wouldn't be anywhere. Literally. Without the support of Berkeley and the Haas School of Business. So it's with great pleasure that uh, tonight we have here Rich Lyons, the Dean of Haas, uh, and a supporter of in innovation and entrepreneurship across Berkeley uh, to say a few words and kick off tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you. I was told I have two minutes to pitch. Otherwise, you'll know I don't know what I'm talking about. So here's my two minutes. I want to pitch you on transformation. That's the business we are in. Nothing satisfies me more than when a student comes up to me in the cafe and says, six months ago, or when I started the program, starting a company, they do that. Now, I do that. I get it. That's not knowledge transfer or even cognition skills. 
That's a change in identity. That's part of the transformation business we're in. Here's the second element of the transformation business we're in. When we talk about the Founders Pledge, for example, that so many of our wonderful alums have, have signed, and we talk about building a bigger engine here as an institution, serving more students, serving more companies, serving more value creation, right? We just named a building out there from a 36-year-old signer of the Founders Pledge, and that building is going to animate a lot of our own programming. Another signer of the Founders Pledge just had a liquidity event and is putting $4.3 million that came out of his own founder's equity that he pledged to us, and it's going to student support. In particular, he said, I want it to go to student support. I want it to go to children of immigrants. That's what I want to fund. So fund what makes you tick. And then finally, when we think about transformation more broadly, at Berkeley, at these six wonderful UC campuses that are, that are defined here, um, we together are you, we, are defining that frontier, the frontier at which society is advancing. And it really is that. We don't flourish by being the same, commercially or individually. We flourish by being usefully different. Let's get usefully different faster, more efficiently. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. <laughs>
Third tonight, uh, we have Noah, who is co-founder of Javelin Venture Partners, one of our long-term supporters. Um, it's an early stage technology venture firm uh, created by former entrepreneurs uh, with a founder's ethos. Prior to Javelin, Noah was most recently directing the enterprise product line for Google's geospatial products, such as Google Earth and Google Maps. Noah also has an MBA from Haas School of Business. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Ayush, who is a product leader and angel investor. He's currently, currently is head of enterprise products for Facebook. Ayush is responsible for Facebook's vi uh, vision and execution in the enterprise space. Thank you for being here. Next, I'd like to introduce Keith Eady, who is currently VP of Revenue and Partnerships at Adobe Advertising Cloud. Keith joined Adobe uh, when the company was last year acquired, uh, last year acquired Tube Mogul, uh, where he was the Chief Marketing and Strategy Officer. Ten years ago this evening, Tube Mogul uh, was presenting on this very stage to an audience just like yourselves in Launch's predecessor, the Business Plan Competition. They went on to win that competition, and as I said last year, were acquired for over 500 million by Adobe. He, uh, he worked for BCG uh, uh, and joined Tube Mogul in its, in its infancy. Uh, he also has an MBA from UC Berkeley. There's a slight theme to, to these judges. Uh, Second to last, we have uh, Nicholas, who is general partner at Partech, based, Partech Ventures based in San Francisco. Uh, prior to Partech, Nicholas spent 15 years as an entrepreneur and founded several companies. Uh, he has an MBA from the HEC in Paris, and, uh, but he, does ha he is also a graduate in, interna in the international management program from he here, Berkeley Haas, uh, joint with the University of Cologne. Thank you very much. And finally, our seventh judge tonight is Jeremy, who is a founder and managing partner of the House Fund, uh, which is a $6 million pre-seed and seed stage venture fund, and the first fund focused purely on Berkeley startups. They're just across the road uh, opposite the campus. Um, most recently, he's featured as an honoree uh, for this year for education in the Forbes 30 Under 30. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's judges. Okay, last detail, and then Rob and I promise to sit down and get to the teams. So, judges, we're about to start our pitches. Our teams will have two minutes during which to pitch, and then we'll give you two minutes during which to ask teams questions. We're trying to move quickly, so we will have to cut things off, but we think this should give you time to ask one or two questions of each of our teams. So, everybody take a deep breath, get ready to focus, because here come our teams. First up, I would like to welcome Bubble Eyes to the stage. Hello, everyone. The beverage you see before me is called Bubble Tea. It's a $7 billion market in America. The only problem is it only lasts about eight hours. And uh, we're going to be the first company in history to make it last over three months and allow the market to reach its true potential. We are going to make Boba go mainstream. So what's, preventing, so what's preventing Bubble Tea from reaching its full market potential? It's the fact that the product has a short life cycle. So if you buy traditional Boba Tea, the tapioca pearls get hard and inedible upon storage. What we've done is we've created a product that has a long product life cycle. We're one of the first companies to ever do this, and we're able to increase the life cycle to three months and sell bubble tea in an RTD setting in a room temperature supply chain. The way we do this is by creating a stable edible gel system, and this, is, this includes a good gel texture, flavor, and of course shelf stability, but also during the retort process where you have to heat up the beverage to sterilize the beverage, um, our pearls are able to withstand that. Um, and this is 
what makes up our fundamental IP in terms of defensibility of the business. So the business model is very simple. We take 40% of each SKU sold. Um, and if we're able to sell 200, if we're able to ramp up to sell 250 million units a year, um, which is about 10% of our target market, um, at an average cost of $4, we could see numbers in the hundreds of millions in terms of revenue size. Um, I wanted to point out this is not an uncommon uh, size for revenue for beverage companies. Um, so our go-to-market strategy is uh, based on selling to mom-and-pop retailers near college campuses as a first go-to. Um, that's the market that is we've identified. Okay. So that's the end of our time. Uh, yeah, so anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions? I have a question. What's the straw experience? People like to suck the boba through the straw. And the way that we deliver that is actually, we have a straw as part of our uh, bubble tea. And the straw is actually on part of the bottle. In, in an era where everybody is so health conscious, how do you make people comfortable that your bubbles are good for you? So they're actually lower calorie, um, but our target market segment is they're looking for a treat beverage. So from our customer surveys, we've found that people are not, they don't care as much about the calories. Um, so it is a high calorie snack beverage. Is there any validation of the technology at all by third parties, or have you talked to beverage companies? We've interviewed licensing? over 200 people with our formula, and they've taste tested it. Yes. Have you looked at licensing? Talk Sorry? To any, have you talked to any large beverage companies, thought about licensing? No, we haven't. We've, we've talked to a commercialization partner that we're in talks with right now, actually. Uh, there's a ton of boba shops in Berkeley. I'm wondering if this is just a Berkeley thing. How many boba shops are there in the country? There's a lot. Um, so I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. We did market analysis of the whole country. It's in the many thousands. Who's the demographic that you're targeting? Uh, 14 to 22 year olds are the primary demographic. So high school and college students. And are you doing co-pack or are you actually manufacturing this yourself? Initially we're gonna be co-packing and later on when we raise enough money we're gonna be um, actually manufacturing it ourselves, yes. Thank Next, I'd like to welcome to the stage DNA Light Therapeutics. Hello? Okay, sorry. All right, we are uh, DNA Light Therapeutics, and we're replacing surgeries using DNA and gene therapy. Um, so our first target is a specific form of colorectal cancer, which has a long name, but its prevalence is one in 10,000, and it's caused by a single gene mutation that leads to a 100% chance of getting colorectal cancer by age 40. Um, and the current treatment strategy is to have your entire large intestine removed, and then you have a coloscopy bag, and you also have uh, difficulties um, uh, absorbing certain nutrients. Um, but recent studies have come out that this disease is driven by stem cells and they're the necessary target. Um, but more importantly, this particular set of mutations is also found in general colorectal cancer, which is the second deadliest cancer uh, in the US today. So our strategy is to deliver a healthy copy of the gene to the necessary cells. So this has been attempted before, but the previous vehicles all got stuck in this mucosal barrier and when it were one unable to penetrate to the correct cells, while we were able to uh, develop proprietary modifications that allowed us to penetrate and deliver to the correct cells for the first time. Uh, whoops. Um, and here's an example of a pig intestine where we were able to deliver uh, our, our, our vehicle. Um, so this is, our goal is to go after the specific colon cancer market 
and then expand to general colorectal cancer, and then to general GI disease. Um, our CEO is Mubhead, who just graduated with a master's in chemical engineering uh, from Berkeley and has both a science and uh, business background, and I'm finishing my PhD here at Berkeley with a thesis based on gene therapy. Um, and to date, we've uh, created a working prototype, filed a provisional patent, just closed a pre-seed round, and we're about to go into an accelerator to begin animal testing. And we ask that if anyone has any, knows of anyone that would be interested in partnering with us, both from Big Pharma or from a drug delivery size, we'd love to be in contact with them. Thank you. What's your IP strategy? Can you sure? So we've been patent? able to patent uh, the combination of the vehicle with this particular uh, gene that we're delivering. Uh, so it's a combination of both. It's the combination, yeah. So I know very little about uh, this cancer space, but I understand that there are many different mutations of the cancer as well. Right. Uh, I'm, I heard you mention that this is the second most common type of cancer, but the specific solution that you guys have come up with, what percentage of the colon cancer situations does that address? Yeah, so 80% of general colorectal cancers have the same mutation. Uh, it's, yeah. What are, you, what are you most worried about um, in achieving your milestones today? Sure, so we're uh, beginning animal testing currently, but also the uh, FDA regulatory path is definitely a challenge. So that's, uh, if anyone else knows someone with FDA experience, we'd love to be in contact with them too. So what validation has there been to date? Uh, of the you know, how, sure, how so you we've know? been able to do uh, both in vitro and ex vivo studies, as well as one pilot uh, in vivo study, and now we're expanding our animal studies currently. So we're still preclinical. The gene therapy is modifying the cells present, or are you introducing the modified cells? It would be modifying the cells that are present, so we would be delivering just the DNA to the cells locally. Yeah. Oh. Let's talk later. Let's talk later. Our next team to pitch is wonderful. <laughs> Hello? Technical difficulties, it's okay. Hi, I'm Karen. So showcase the power of your API with Wonderful. What is an API? An API is an application program interface, and it allows a developer to utilize functionality from another company. So a great example is Lyft, where their core technology is all about connecting drivers and passengers, but all the other functions are outsourced to third-party APIs. So payments to Stripe, maps to Google Maps. There are 16,000 APIs in the market and growing. Wonderful is a way to help enterprises so, uh, attract and entertain developers. So the big problem is that Susan is a product manager at a third-party API provider. She faces two issues, acquiring developer and making her API easy to integrate. The wonderful solution helps providers achieve the 333 golden rule, which is three seconds to understand the API, 30 seconds to find an entry point, and when three minutes to utilize the input. The automated solution is our technology and one endpoint for both mobile and web so that you can open up the API to mobile developers. The vision is to showcase the power of the API. When I was a product manager, this was the process of integrating an API. It actually took weeks. And this is the process with Wonderful. It takes minutes. So why now? The software paradigm is shifting quickly. In the past, it was all about monolithic software and utilizing everything internally. And now, it's leveraging the power of APIs. This is a $20 billion industry. So we're in talks with IBM right now. 
and we're trying to make them a client, and the way that they're thinking about developer acquisition for Watson is that Watson is really hard to understand by itself, but in partnership with context with other APIs, it's easier to understand. So Watson with Twitter, much easier to understand. Um, we are trying to facilitate partnerships for them, and that will drive developer uh, retention and acquisition for them. So this is the opportunity. There are 16,000 APIs in the market and growing. Everyone's fighting for developers to use their API. We have two beta clients currently, and we're going to charge per API call. We're the team to make this happen, and we believe in a world where it's truly plug and play with APIs, and wouldn't that be wonderful? Thank you. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about some of your customer conversations to date? Yeah, so a lot of the customers we're talking to, especially the two beta clients, one of them specifically, it was a typical SaaS platform. They're actually attracting marketers, and now they're exposing their API, so they're trying to attract developers. So a lot of their documentation was internal, and they've moved it externally. What they want to help have this help them with is their developer funnel. So getting developers in quickly, using their API, and driving usage. So that's kind of the conversations we're having with a lot of these API providers. Um, for a company who hasn't before really published their API or exposed it, mm -hmm. you know, how do you go about helping them to make it, you know, meet the golden rule? Yeah, so um, they're great, like, swagger for, like, open source, so that would be the first step. But we wrap um, any of those APIs to a GraphQL endpoint, and so our solution is more of a lightweight solution to make it one endpoint. So they would typically have to have API documentation before we could get started. So if my app is built on a whole bunch of APIs mm -hmm. that I have picked up from your marketplace, uh, my app could be highly vulnerable, right, because one of those APIs fail, and... I don't know what's yeah. going to happen to my app. What type of SLAs do you intend to enforce, and how do you think that will affect the market? Yeah, so the way we think about it is this one endpoint is the way that we would track which API fails. So currently, if you were to utilize a bunch of different endpoints as a developer, you have to manage that flow with each provider, right? And so we're making that one place so we handle all the error messagings and ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh, can you talk a little bit about competition? There's, it seems to me that there's a bunch of other companies dealing with uh, simplifying the use of API. Yeah, so that's a great question. There are a lot of API marketplaces like Rapid API or app API aggregators. We're actually going for the enterprise, so going for the API, um, that the API provider. So we're trying to help them with their funnel. So this tool would live on their site. So basically, you know, someone like um, Stripe or someone that provides an API would have this interface, and that's how a, uh, a developer would come in and utilize the API. So kind of going for the other side of the market. Yeah. Some APIs don't play nice with each other. Yeah. Are, 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 to what extent are you providing some type of score or validation for that particular customer to say, hey, look, you need to update this and improve it so that you're playing nice with the 80%, the 80-20 the rule? Yeah, so um, we work with REST APIs, and we wrap those endpoints so to a GraphQL layer. So um, if they're not on uh, REST, potentially it's, it's not going to work. So yeah, we would look that way. Okay, great. Thanks. Next, I'm very pleased to introduce Coco. Some of you may find it a little bit shocking that women spend a lot of makeup money. They spend $32 billion in the US and $150 billion worldwide on makeup. Why? Because when a woman looks good and feels good about her appearance, she has confidence. The problem is that the makeup shopping experience doesn't inspire confidence. It's a miserable process of sorting through brands, formulas, colors, shades. And if she picks the wrong one, she's wasted her money. So we think there should be a better way to do this. And especially in the era of I want to buy something, everything online, I want it shipped to my house, there's no solution right now for online purchase of color cosmetics and a consultation. This is what you get at the makeup counter. This is the old way of getting a makeover. You go to the store, a woman works on you, $300 later, a whole bag of shame later, you walk out with this and people say, oh yeah, that's a new look for you. We can do better. 
The women we're targeting are busy professional women, moms who want makeup, want to buy it. They don't spend the afternoon in Sephora. They don't really enjoy that experience, but she'd like to buy makeup. And she wants to deliver it to her house because she buys everything else online. So how is she going to get this solution done? They told us in focus groups again and again, all she wants is tell me what is right for me, how do I buy it, what colors, what shades, which formulas. So we've built the first color accurate platform. A woman simply answers 10 questions. We then use an app to analyze her skin tone and then we present to her the color cosmetics, the combination and the video tutorial on how to do these things together to get the result that she wants for the style and look she's going for. When we do this, we found that women are purchasing from us. We have a 50% conversion rate when women receive the color cosmetic recommendations and one of our first buyers, Jen, she's ready to reorder already, which is wonderful because these are consumable products she wants to buy again and again. And we earn 30 to 50% margin on the products that we sell on our platform. Makeup is not only a large product category, it's a very lucrative product, card product category. Big market, we're getting good conversion. We think we have solved color cosmetic shopping for the internet. Thank you. Could you talk about your customer acquisition? I think that's going to be the most challenging um, part of this business. Yeah, so CAC can be very high in cosmetics. It's usually around $30 for complexion products. In our first sale of like $150, we've already paid back the CAC. We think that the beauty channels we're going to use to reach our consumers are going to be lifestyle channels and bloggers. The users we have at the beginning, we're just started with product market fit, have come to us through our networks and through women's conferences. We think we're going to reach the women we want to reach through, through the lifestyle blogger media and not through the normal marketing channels of beauty videos and magazines and things like that. So we don't have an accurate measurement from CAC, but the industry standard is about $30. I don't know how long you've been up and running, but average purchase size, reorder rate, do you have those metrics yet? So we have just a small amount of sales. We just got this new product as a part of launch and expanding what we're doing. We've seen, we've just started doing this new product, this new MVP. Um, and so we don't actually, we don't have enough data to really, for me to speculate on that well. Are you trying to compete with uh, Sephora or uh, have you considered licensing the uh, technology to Sephora, do Sephora's other one? So it's too early to say whether licensing is the most lucrative model versus B2C. I think when we try to do our CAC and really get a robust measurement, I do know one thing though. The women we've surveyed do not want to go to Sephora. They're actually women who are opting out of buying at Sephora. Sephora is well targeted to the young maven, really edgy makeup, but those professional women who have money to spend and do not feel like they're being well served, that's who we're finding is most interested because the other ones who love going to the store, that's, so we're not going to take the Sephora customer. We have a whole bunch of women who are frightened to death of Sephora and that's who we sell to. Can you talk a little bit more about your technology and how that gives you an advantage? Yeah, so um, this uh, whole premise is based on doing color matching at a distance, and that's a technology I invented. I have 24 patents, and I ran the color research group at HP Labs. So I filed the very earliest results, and can I take a photo of somebody I've never seen in person and actually calculate their skin tone? And we can because we simply have our hold, especially printed color chart, when she takes the photo and then we can um, extract her skin tone. That's the enabling technology that didn't exist before, and now with a cell phone and a camera in every woman's pocket, we have the ability to do that. Thank you. All right, our last team in this group who we are happy to announce is May and Meadow. Thanks, uh, I'm Human Hafezi, I'm CEO of May and Meadow. I'm gonna talk to you about breastfeeding technology today uh, because my daughter was born and had a lot of breastfeeding difficulties. And what my wife and I found out is that for parents, especially moms who are worried that their baby is not getting enough milk, there is no way to find out at home because you can't see the milk going into the baby's mouth. And that leads to a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety, and a sense that you're failing as a mom. Um, there are also a very large number of moms who would like to know how much the baby drinks because they want to pump as much as they need to and no more. 
Our solution for all of those moms is a wearable patch that mom can wear one feeding or all day. It safely and accurately measures the milk intake for the baby using bioimpedance, sends it to a cell phone where it can be tracked, compared to established norms, and shared with your clinician. We're currently testing this with moms, and they're um, extremely enthusiastic about the technology. In the US, Europe, and Canada, there are about 10 million moms uh, who breastfeed. Nearly all of them would like to know the milk intake. Um, the technology is um, uh, 510K exempt from a regulatory standpoint, so it can go direct to market. And so we see direct sale to moms uh, as a place to start. Uh, eventually long-term clinically because um, Affordable Care Act actually specifies that breastfeeding supplies and services be covered at 100%. So we have uh, work to, um, we're doing work to gain traction with the clinical community. These parents are extremely motivated. They're spending seven and a half billion dollars a year on supplies and services, so we see a great opportunity there. And lastly, we have a terrific team. Uh, a lot of experience in sensors, wearables, digital health, and lactation and fantastic advisors. Joe Schulman um, supervises Nick Hughes for the state of California and is exploring with us the use of this for premature babies. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the consumer experience? Like how much friction is there for moms to use this? How much pressure is there? Friction, as in what do they need to do to, um, uh, to get a measurement? Yeah, it's, it's very easy to use. You can actually use it with one hand. So mom takes the patch, right here actually, puts it on, turns it on from her cell phone, and basically leaves it on all day. Because for a breastfeeding mom, especially one who just gave delivery, you can't have a complicated operation. It really has to be very easy to use. Uh, two things, expected cost of the device, and do you need you one for six months and you're good, or what's the, re the reorder need? And then two, how do you compare, or what's your um, perception or perspective on weighing the baby post-feed versus this? Great. Um, cost, we think um, uh, $150, $200 is a good place to start for the direct-to-mom out-of-pocket. Uh, larger group will get reimbursement, eventually. Um, uh, the second question was weighing the baby. So that's a standard of care. It requires a sophisticated enough scale to measure a two-ounce change in a six-pound baby. So those are $1,000 scales. You have to go into the hospital to do the way, feed, way. Many moms do. They would prefer to do it at home with convenience and um, at their leisure. What are the specific health benefits that'll underpin the insurance reimbursement argument? Um, so breastfeeding is just known to have huge benefits, both for you know, child and mom. Right? So there's diabetes, cardiovascular, um, immunity, on the mom's side, there's, there's um, mental health, and, and uh, I think there's even cancer protection. There was even a study out of Scandinavia that showed higher IQ for breastfeeding babies. So it's, it's just huge, and moms are constantly told breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. So any help they can get, I think is appreciated. I'm a father of a 15-day-old, so yeah. totally appreciate this. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> the error margin and how do you see that changing over time and what are the areas, what are the problems that have yet to be solved that, that worry you? Great. So uh, we have about a 10% accuracy on the technology. Um, that's not as good as a hospital grade scale, but we can measure multiple feedings, right? So we get actually a more representative value of the baby's intake than just going in once and doing a spot check. Um, Technology-wise, we're pretty comfortable with it. You have to get the user interface right because you can't actually make moms feel more anxious because now they're being measured and they don't know if the mom next door had more. And so, so there's a lot of, I think, thinking that needs to go into how you do that properly. Okay, I hope you enjoyed those pictures as much as I did. Now it's the hard work is over to you, the audience. I want you to take your phones out. I want you to open up that guidebook app. And in, there, in the menu there, you'll see audience choice one. Please go in there. there are, for every team that just pitched, there's a scale of one to 10. If you liked it a lot, give it a high number. If you didn't like it so much, give it a low number. We're going to tabulate all these scores 
and use it to award our audience choice. We are ready to get started. Thanks for submitting your votes. Uh, yep, thanks for submitting your votes in Guidebook. I hope that you will now put away your phones so you can give your full attention to Kiwi, our next team who will be pitching. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Felipe. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kiwi, and we make food delivery with robots. What was the problem that we identified? Basically, when you order something on demand, when you order food on demand, let's say that you order a pizza, $9 pizza, you end paying another $9 just in delivery fee, service fee, and tips. And that was really shocking for us. So basically, we created a platform, a food delivery app, powered by robots. But how exactly it works? So you go to our app, select the dish, select the restaurant, select the dish, and we have humans at the other side of the continent. Actually, this robot is being controlled from Colombia six miles away, and by that, with that solution, solution we are cutting 80% of our costs. What is, the, what is the current market? What is the market? Uh, the perfect spot to start a, food delivery, a robot food delivery company is universities, because we have early adopters, we have a less variables to control, and also we have the restaurants and the customers in a very small coverage area. Uh, just assume that 80% uh, of the students uh, eat at least one meal out of their homes. So just in UC Berkeley, it's an 80 million market. We have 700 campuses like UC Berkeley. What we have done? We have delivered more than 1,000 orders since we launched. This Saturday, we are going to deliver 100 orders just in one day. Right now, we are the company in the world that is making more deliveries with robots, and we have 1,000 students in waiting lists for use our product. The team, we have people from UC Berkeley, we have PhD in physics, we have uh, Jason, he used to work at NASA, he's in charge of technology, we have Sergio, he is uh, in charge of the pilots, he is also a Tinder master, and uh, myself, that uh, my last company, I sold it to uh, Rocket Internet, it was a food delivery company, and have experience with more than 70,000 orders. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hey. What's the, what's the payback rate on a Kiwi? How many deliveries do you have to make per robot in order for that robot to pay back? According to our numbers, like this robot cost $800, including labor, to build. According to our forecast, in just four months, we can get the money back. Um, so I've just been around campus and I keep bumping into this thing. It's it's kind of it's kind of kind of weird. I think it might be following me. But um, how, how do you how do you make something like this socially acceptable? And, and you know what are some of the regulatory financial yeah. issues? I'm very grateful with the UC Berkeley community because they have uh, accept our robots and our work very well. Actually, last week uh, was the call day and they put the robots in the video and people actually are super friendly with the robots. So I think that the best spot to assert this company is UC Berkeley. I like how it has a face on it. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, on places like, let's say the Google campus, right? The Google bikes go missing all the time. <laughs> Say again? The, the Google bikes, they go missing all the time because okay. people just pick up the Google bike and take it wherever, and that's just a bike. Okay. Uh, if someone were to see this robot, what's stopping them from just picking it up, taking it wherever, it's dismantling a, it? It's a really bad idea toy? because it has a lot of sensors, so it's like taking the police to your place. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a concern, and yeah, that's, it, it has a lot of sensors, and we can have someone go to the robot in just one minute. How do you fit a pizza in there? No, <laughs> no. I mean, okay, yeah. But, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Yeah. More, yeah. more, more seriously, uh, you know, is this for individual orders? Uh, how, how, how do you serve? Uh, you know. Yeah. As as I mentioned, it? as I mentioned in my presentation, I delivered more than seventy thousand orders, and this robot can like. It's perfect for 90% of the orders. We're going to have bigger robots, but that's our second step. Okay. Thank you very much.
Thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, I'd, love, I'd like to welcome to the stage Student Loans Guy. Hello, everyone. My name is Brandon Yawn. I'm the founder of studentloansguy.com, and we are making college debt easier for all people. So with graduation coming up in a couple of weeks, how many people are going to be in this situation? I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room. But you're not alone. There's 44 million people in the US that have student loans, and that's nearly one in five US adults. And the problem, it's actually doubled in the last 10 years. It's gone from $500, million, $500 billion market to a $1.3 trillion market. In the next 10 years, it's supposed to double again. So this is a huge problem, and it's putting a huge burden on the young generation. So what have we done to actually solve this? So we've built a solution, uh, an algorithm, that personalizes uh, the repayment process uh, for our student loan borrowers. And we're doing this not just to connect people to refinancing options, but we're also connecting people to government assistance plans um, that cover both all public and private options. And people can find their best personalized repayment plan in a matter of 60 seconds or less. So how does it work? You enter your information, things like your income, your student loan balance, your interest rate, um, your credit score, and based on that, we'll tell you which repayment plan is best, whether that's refinancing, um, or one of the assistance plans to the government, and we'll show calculators to show how much money you could actually save within each of these plans. So how do we make money if it's free? We have uh, partnerships in place with the leading uh, student loan refinance companies in the, uh, in, in, the, in the space, and we make referral fees every time somebody refinances their student loan. Early traction, we're already generating revenue. Um, we're profitably acquiring customers through targeted Facebook advertising. Um, and how are we going to scale? So we see the opportunity to partner with universities. Um, so we have a pilot, pilot partnership in place with the West Virginia University Alumni Association. And the reason this is attractive to universities is because it's a simple tool that helps all borrowers. Um, and we can help, to, uh, help them decrease their default rate, increase alumni engagement and giving. And why is our team the right one to do this? Uh, I myself worked at Credit Karma uh, for, and led the student loan channel for about two years before starting this. I'm a Haas MBA. Uh, our team also includes somebody else who worked at Credit Karma with me on the marketing team. And we have a university sales advisor who was one of my classmates at Haas as well. Um, we want to get people to this position to unshackle them from the burden of student loan debt. Um, most people only get one, you know, student loans when they're a student and then, you know, they're paying them off. Is it a, you know, limited opportunity for you to do one or two refinancings? Like how many refinancings will somebody do? Typically one, um, but you can refinance more than once. And, and do you, how much, do you make enough money on that and, you know, for it to be worthwhile? You yeah, so an average refinance, uh, I guess, uh, what I would get would be uh, on average about $300 and that can go much higher because I know that because I, did that at a larger company at Credit Karma, negotiating those deals. And how much uh, are you saving uh, the student or the former student, typically? Um, so the, all the refinancing companies like to market it between fifteen and 20000 is their average. But they're looking at people who have lots of debt a lot of the time, hundreds of thousands of dollars from medical school, law school, things like that. Um, for the government assistance plans, it can actually be much higher um, because they can get their loans forgiven after a period of time if they're on an income-driven repayment plan. Um, but I would say, you know, typically it's easily in the thousands of dollars for every person. Brandon, I think we've met before. Uh, congrats on your new company. Um, <laughs> I'm curious how uh, you're going to attract customers to your site and how, how costly is that going to be? Yeah, so right now um, I'm running some Facebook ads targeting uh, specific people who are likely to refinance. Um, we're actually profitably, profitably acquiring customers at small scale thus far, so need to ramp that up. Um, and then the, the, the opportunity, I think, to, to grow much faster is by partnering with universities. So I've talked to about 10 different universities thus far. Uh, everybody likes the idea. Um, they all want to see a case study. They all, nobody wants to be the first mover necessarily. So it's great that I have a pilot partnership um, basically that should be going out very soon. Um, and then I can distribute that through other universities. And if university channel takes off, that's the first channel that students will actually go to to, to get that advice. Um, and then that, that creates a bond more with your university as well. And that could obviously grow much very quickly uh, if that takes off.
All right, our next team to pitch is PureCat. Hi, I'm Nancy. This is Alvin, and we are PureCat. Meet Mary. Mary is a technical writer in her 30s who in September got laid off from her job. Despite the initial shock, Mary saw this as an opportunity to transition into the freelance career she had been dreaming of. And Mary is a part of a changing workforce. Last year, 55 million Americans earned some form of freelance income. Yet, even while more and more people are trying freelance, the reality for those trying to make it their career is much more daunting. As Mary quickly learned, being a freelancer really means juggling 10 roles at once. And even though helpful tools and products exist, Mary is overwhelmed. What she really wants is a support system that will help her break through the noise. She doesn't just want to learn how to use FreshBooks for accounting. She wants to learn how to build and manage a business and how to build a career for herself. PeerCat, oh, sorry, old side. PeerCat will be an online accelerator, business accelerator for freelancers that stay with them as they grow. So with PeerCat, Mary will access modular learning content that helps her to learn new business skills and tools. With each module, she'll also be matched with peer, peers and experts that act as her sounding board for the day-to-day -day decisions. Long term, PeerCat will use data to provide a personalized experience. Gone will be the days where Mary had to Google and interpret 20 different blog articles about finding new clients. Instead, she'll have PeerCat, and PeerCat will show her how to be a technical writer in the nonprofit world living in California. We're tapping into a big market with a simple revenue model. Our 60 customer interviews have revealed a willingness to pay for membership, and we also plan to partner with freelance tool providers to create sponsored learning content. We've already kicked off two test groups, and the initial results are promising. This summer, we look forward to building out a real MVP in order to further validate the demand and engagement freelancers have on our platform. I'm Nancy, like I said, and I'm an MBA at Haas, and I've built workforce uh, professional development programs across multiple companies. Alvin is an engineer at IBM who builds advanced analytics products. We're hiring, and at PeerCat, we envision a future where anybody can build a sustainable and long-term career as a freelancer. <laughs> Join us. Um, so you said you've ran two cohorts. Does it work? Yeah, so, so far what we've seen is that people are really interested in this intimate group experience. We actually posted into existing Facebook writers groups, and we still got signups for people looking for more engagement and a more targeted learning exercise. We're still refining the exact facilitation model that's going to build trust as quickly as possible so that we don't have to facilitate every group long term. Are, are there low or no tech examples of this? Maybe schools that have content and mentorship that do work? Yeah, I think that what we haven't seen is an effective bridging of both uh, modular content and the facilitation model. And so, um, you know, I think people might be familiar with lynda.com. It's a very successful online learning platform that has a lot of videos. Um, actually, one of the launch sponsors talked about how adults don't really want to watch a bunch of videos. They want really quick tips and ways to bring, put that into practice. So our model is to give them the tips, have them do an activity, uh, to put it to practice right away, and then talk about it as a group. What have you learned about the willingness to pay and exactly sort of how yeah. sophisticated up the price scale are you going? So um, it is a hypothesis right now. Our tests are free currently. We do want to charge a fee for our pilot because um, we found that there is a little bit of an entry hurdle we want to enact to make sure that the commitment is there. But so far, what we tested is $10 a month in our conversations. And the question is, are you willing to invest in your professional development for the same price as Spotify? Hopefully, yes. Otherwise, you know, you're not in this business. So. How, how do you tinderize these freelancers, right? I mean, you're trying to connect them to the right people that, that can really accelerate their own business. So. Have you built that yet? Is that and how's that going? 
We haven't built it yet. Um, one of the things we're really excited about is this discussion forum because um, we want to be able to mine that conversational data to learn not only what questions people are asking and how they're solving for freelance problems today, but also the way they like to learn. And so over time, we're gonna gather the interaction data with our content, we're gonna gather engagement data and conversational data in order to help us be more effective with our peer matching. Okay. Oh, no, that's oh, it's not yours. <laughs> I, can't, I can't keep it. Yeah, no, this, you can't keep it. Oh. Disappointing. Uh, next, uh, I'm very happy to welcome to the stage Hygieia. Let me show you something. This, believe it or not, happens in almost every hospital or they come near for, to this happening. Imagine the threat that people around this are exposed to. Well, this is not the story of just hospitals. Untimely trash pickup <coughs> is a problem in a $54 billion market <coughs> comprising of all these seg segments. However, we are targeting a $12 billion market of hospitals and janitorial services to start with and then planning to expand to the other markets out there. Our patent pending IoT solution to this problem is basically deploying sensors inside waste bins, having them collect data, pushing it into the cloud, passing it through our predictive algorithm, <coughs> algorithm uh, and then making the data available as actionable intelligence to the waste workers. Now, how do we generate value to our customers? One, they are, they are estimated to save about 30% of the janitorial time they use to go to bins and look at them before picking them up. Uh, they are also going to save on the expensive waste liners like compost and biohazardous bins, which are 20x more expensive than the regular ones. Uh, also, they can repurpose the non-used bins to the used area because now they have data, and that way they can save on procuring new bins. Uh, the revenue model is an initiation fee added with a SaaS model fee, uh, a recurring revenue of $10 a month. Uh, a go-to strategy is direct first for the pilots and then through our channels. We are already in talks with Waxi and Stericycle to take us to them. Uh, we already have pilot MOUs signed with three institutions in the Bay Area, two of which are major janitorial service providers who can themselves serve as channels for us to get into many other clients as well. So once we do this, we are looking forward to go back to the city of LA uh, and help the mayor because he has already invited us to solve, to work with the city hall to solve his city's uh, waste management problems. Uh, as a team, we have experience working for high tech growth companies. Uh, I handle the operation strategy and uh, the product architecture. Parshad is the techie on the team and Pooja handles the customer engagement and marketing. Now, where are we at? We started off with a $1,000 bootstrap, then we got a $10,000 competition grant with which we prototyped and brought it. Now we have the prototype ready, it's just ready for manufacturing. We have the design frozen, and we are seeking seed investment for, uh, for, to, go, to, to execute those pilots and to go mass market. So today I'd like to welcome you to Hygieia's larger mission, which is to eliminate waste from waste management. Thank you. <laughs> So what is, what's the problem? Is the problem that they don't know that they're full? Or is it that the schedule is wrong and it's just on a, on a time-based time schedule, not a demand-based schedule? Or is it just that you got a budget problem? What, what's the real core problem here? So uh, in, the, in the healthcare space, the problem is twofold. One, the bins inside the facility. And the second one, the, the main bins, which they're which their collection company takes from. So inside the facility, the data is very erratic. Uh, for example, operation room. Some, some surgeries might get like a bin of trash. Some of them might be like five bins overflowing. And this is what doctors have told us. Uh, so in such a situation, they find it hard to reallocate their personnel who might be doing some other task and figure priorities out. Like, I need to go here and hit this bin or else you know, the next surgeon is going to face a problem. Uh, whereas in the janitorial space, they are always operating on a very thin margin and they are always understaffed. So they overwork their staff just because in the daytime they go around watching bins and collecting air from bins basically. Yeah. 
Can you retrofit the existing bins or do you have to buy yours? So our sensors are strategically designed so that they can go onto any existing bin out there. Yeah, so it's retrofitable. Who is, is the primary benefit, the primary benefit is a kind of quality control benefit to the hospital? Um, and is, is that true? And is there a direct cost savings and an ROI on a direct basis? So and second question is, do you need the sanitation services company to cooperate with you, to, to integrate with you? So for, for the hospitals, the, uh, the benefits is twofold. Basically, they, uh, they boost up on the efficiency, but more so it's a, more, uh, it's a topic of regulation compliance for them where they don't have bins overflowing, uh, hazardous bins overflowing. But for a janitorial setup, it's more of uh, efficiency building as well as cost saving in, in consumables. Uh, and the second question. Uh, no, uh, it depends on who is servicing the facilities. So, for example, some facilities like to own their own janitorial team, uh, which is very le a, a small number of them. But most of them, they outsource it to companies like Able or, or, or Flagship, and they are our target customers in those cases. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our last team in this second group of pitches is Ohm School. Welcome. <laughs> These are some of my third grade students from when I was teaching with Headstand, a nonprofit that pioneered mindfulness in schools. We'd have a blast together. They leave my class feeling so calm and relaxed. But I realized there was something deeply wrong with our model because I was sending them back to a teacher who looked like this on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Teaching is one of the most stressful professions, and because of this, teachers are leaving left and right. And it's a costly problem. In just three districts in California, it costs $170 million a year in just turnover costs. The Ohm School platform provides the bite-sized on-demand resilience training that teachers need, as well as a virtual teacher's lounge where teachers can engage and connect with one another, and a virtual gym to practice together. These are some of the results from our beta tests, and teachers love us. There's no other company in the market right now so laser focused on teacher retention as we are. We're not just a mindfulness app on your phone or a professional development session. We are a platform developed for teachers by teachers. We're also a team of teachers who have over 20 years of classroom experience. I'm Emily. I was a product director at Headstand, a nonprofit that pioneered mindfulness in schools. I'm getting my MBA at Haas, and I'm I was employee four at a Y Combinator accepted startup. Lakshmi is a PhD student in special education and has deep sales expertise through UPS. And Lakita, Lakita is our head of operations, and she's turned around some of the worst performing schools in LA and DC. We are on this train to get to home school to as many teachers as we can. We already have $9,000 in sales for four schools and more on the way. Why now? There's a huge teacher shortage right now and it's doubling in the next five years. Who will take care of our kids in the classroom and who will take care of the adults who spend more time with our kids than their own parents? It happens to be Teacher Appreciation Week next week and I want us to take time to take three deep breaths in appreciation for our teachers. Please breathe in three, two, and one. Thank you. What, what, are, what are some of the other features of the app that will you know, lead to relaxation. Oh, because you want to relax right now? <laughs> um, so the, what's really cool about what, what we offer is there's things that you can use in the teacher's day. So for example, one of our favorite things that teachers love is intention setting right before they start a class. So most teachers don't choose this profession to make money. It's, it's a calling and it's to be a teacher. And so when they're burned out by thinking about why am I even doing this job really helps them get back into that positive mindset. Um, 
sorry to bring it back down to numbers. So, w what do you expect uh, you know, the, the the model to be uh, uh, per in terms of revenue per? I don't know how you think about it per school, per teacher, per district. Yeah. So, we are selling per teacher. So it's a school license um, for one year. It's 120 for a teacher. So on average, it's about a $3,600 contract per school. Could you tell us a little bit about usage? Do teachers use this on a daily basis? What's um, you know DAU, MAU, all that good stuff? Yeah, so they use it. So our program is a three-week program, and they use it every day for five to 10 minutes a day. That's all we told them to use it for, but what was really surprising is they're engaging with it more. That um, the virtual teacher lounge feature, which is kind of like Facebook for teachers, they're, it surprised us they were engaging with it by posting and sharing on it. And how has churn been? Churn. Oh, so it hasn't turned yet. <laughs> um, we. <laughs> um, it's so our pilot is wrapping up at on Monday um, so and so they're actually asking us for, for us to come back for the second module which is how do you bring this into the classroom I hope that's put you all in a calm frame of mind to make the right decision when you now move on to make your votes and, and uh, for that last selection of five teams. So if you could all stay in your seats, we'll do this a bit more quickly than we did the last one, and pull out your phone, get on the guidebook app, and cast your votes for each team, each of the five teams you've just seen. And now we're ready for our third round of pitches. Um, our first team up is I Treat MD. so we'll ask you guys to join us. Thank you. I'll wait for them to show our slides. Hi, we are Team I Treat MD. We help doctors be doctors, not scribes. Every day, a million doctors in the United States see their patients. And every day, each of them will spend an average of two hours documenting the patient encounter in their EMR systems. Otherwise, they don't get paid, and they hate it. Why does it take so long to document a patient encounter? Doctors have to wait through screen after screen, click through menus, pop-ups, and type information. This is just one encounter, takes about 10 minutes, and costs $112 billion in lost revenue. Some doctors refuse to touch the EMR systems and use dictation and scribes instead. Well, that costs about $13 billion. And then they have to find the right diagnosis codes and billing codes. Then they leave behind $125 billion on the table because of wrong codes. We have solved this problem by creating a smart workflow platform that automatically generates fully structured encounter documentation at a blazing fast pace. The key is structured data. It allows us to use AI and machine learning to understand and predict the behavior of doctors as well as patients. We don't replace an EMR, we just make them better. Our customers love us because we increase their top line revenue while reducing the bottom line prices. We launched our solution about six months ago. We have about 10 practices as customers. We already have two hospital networks. Our revenue model has been vetted by our customers, and yes, we do have some revenue. We are the right team to execute this solution. Between the three of us, we have deep expertise in workflow optimization, startups, big data, AI, clinical expertise, and healthcare sales. I hope you will join us in our quest to make lives better for doctors as well as patients. Thank you. Nice pitch, Neba. Thank you. Uh, tell us about how you're using voice and whether you're uh, um, leveraging any voice technologies to make this even faster than what you're proposing we today. We are. Doctors have a choice. They can actually either tap 
They can, t we call it touch or tap. They can dictate, they can even type. We don't want them to type, so the system is designed that there's minimal dictation required, but we know every patient is different and every doctor is different. So at any point of time, they can just tap it and they can dictate. Um, are you concerned that the EMR vendors might emulate your product once you show them how it should be done? Yeah, you know, we used to worry about that till we started talking to them, until start, George actually, George is a doctor, and George started capturing their screenshots. And man, they can, you can only go so far with what you have, and what they have is, you know, pretty much legacy systems. And most EMR companies don't have very much data. They're actually partnering with us. Uh, we already have some partnerships in place, and they're actually trying to work with us to capture data because they're not capturing anything. Those screens, people aren't doing much with them. They're not entering data at all. And what, what's your roadmap? Like, what would be you know, the next place you take the product? So there are a couple of places where we want to go with the product. One is definitely, you know, we are trying to add, as I said, more AI and more clinical decision support to make the best practices faster and better. Do you have anything to add? Uh, well, uh, we, we guide the doctor uh, during the encounter. So we, uh, we use industry standard best practices that are vetted by our medical advisories. So we can add, and now that we're capturing purely structured data, we can now anticipate what the doctor should do based on the data that they're capturing while they're capturing it. So it's an exciting future. Right. What data sets are you guys training your AI logic off of, and what type of heuristics could be uh, fall back to the AI systems? Yeah, so um, we, we use best practice guidelines from industry standard organization. For example, the um, American Diabetes Association publishes free, freely uh, documentation for what and how you should treat a patient with diabetes, whether you should use metformin, whether you should glipicide, whatever. So as the patient uh, data is entered, we could either do retrospective analysis uh, against what was prescribed versus what was observed in terms of the patient's presentation, and then make it advisories to the doctor in the future, or we can, we can link with existing databases, and I, I love that API presentation because we could go to, for example, an FDB or a Multum database and, and say, hey, doc, you're, you're, you're prescribing two drugs that are interact. So we can do that in real time. So it's a very exciting future for us. Um, and in terms of heuristics, the other thing that is completely lacking right now is closing the loop. The doctor has no idea what is happening with the patient unless the patient ends up in the hospital, comes back to the office, or dies. That's the only time they know. We'll actually plan to close the loop, so that's another area we are planning to go to. And there we can actually, based on the outcomes, we can start predicting that which, uh, which best practice, as, Dr. Uh, as George mentioned, would work the best for that particular patient. So that's really where we want to take our solution, and that's what we are building towards. So part of the, the Lean Launchpad methodology which, uh, which Launch uses is about uh, iterating on your business model through customer interviews. And uh, some, sometimes you're, you're testing your hypotheses and there's as much value in learning what, uh, what hypothes hypotheses are incorrect and what won't work as there is in finding out what will. So the next team tonight, uh, one month ago performed uh, the biggest pivot in the history of launch. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, uh, they were doing uh, a, a video platform and they uh, pivoted to what you'll see tonight. Um, so I will say they are at a slightly earlier stage than the other teams that you'll see pitching tonight, um, but I hope they're compelling in their own right. Green Thumb Robotics. Hello. Ah. Hi, I'm JD. This is Chris. We are Green Thumb Robotics. As Rob mentioned, a massive pivot from what we entered launch with. Um, we've only been working on this for about four weeks, but we found a huge customer problem, and that is that everyone hates weeds. Homeowners hate weeds. Hotels hate weeds. University campuses hate weeds. Corporate campuses hate weeds. They hate weeds so much that they spread poisons in their yards, and they engage in backbreaking manual labor or pay people to do so. It's a $100 billion market full of imperfect solutions, herbicides, groundskeepers, all sorts of tools. None of these are great, but we have the perfect solution, robots. <laughs> Imagine a world where while you're at work, 
a robot is in your yard keeping your yard clear. You get home, your yard is clear, it's beautiful, everyday, consistent. Sounds great, right? How will we do this? Here's a concept. Um, articulated legs let the robot navigate around the yard, climb over small rocks, up ledges, and so forth. Uh, grabber will pull and kill the weeds while they're still small and it's still easy. Um, it'll intelligently navigate your yard, identify and kill weeds, uh, and there's remote human supervisors to fill in the gaps where the autonomy isn't quite good enough. It's the best of both worlds and it helps train data, helps provide training data for the algorithms. The market is huge no matter how you slice it. They will sell the robot as well as recurring service. Um, across the US and the EU, uh, if we charge $10 a month and get the wealthiest 50% of homeowners, that's a $15 billion a year market. And then we'll reach out to hotels and resorts and all those other folks I mentioned earlier. Um, we're the team to build it, although apparently not. Well, I'll tell you a bit about us. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, no one would do better than us, as, uh, as evidenced by this slide. Um, Chris here is a Berkeley-trained engineer, uh, did his master's at MIT. He's worked on the DARPA Autonomous Outdoor Robots program. Uh, I'm an MIT-trained engineer myself. I sold my last startup to Google. Um, on our advisory board is Carl, who's the CEO of Newtonomy, which is an aut autonomous car startup, and is the ex-director of the MIT uh, Robotic Mobility Group. Uh, so we know what we're doing. We also know we work well together since we spent the last year working on uh, something we're not pitching to you today. <laughs> um, next steps, here's where we are. Uh, in about five months, we think we can get a remote control robot demo, profitable autonomy in about two years. Um, we're seeking an accelerator with a hardware focus, introductions to investors, and advice in consumer products and services. Now I'd love to take your questions. I love I love your product design. Um, Thanks. So my um, my mother has a garden and she she would love this. Um, how do how does she have the certainty that you're not going to pull up her favorite flowers in, instead of her weeds? That's a great question. Um, well, so part of that is in fact the human supervisors that we mentioned, right? So we're going to go with autonomy as much as possible, but there's a human in the loop looking in to make sure that we're not pulling up prized petunias, as it were. Thank you. Is the target market the homeowner or more of the actual gardening services? Yes. Landscaping, organ, you know, industry? Great question. Um, should have mentioned that we're still trying to figure that out, but we're leaning towards consumer services. Um, and the reason is the market seems to be much larger. Um, consumers are more okay with the 95% solution, assuming it's false positives and not false negatives, right? We're killing a few less weeds, not extra plants that are not weeds. Um, so that's the direction that we're going. We think that. Uh, an early market might be well proxied by uh, the number of Tesla owners in California. These are <laughs> eco-conscious uh, techophiliacs, right, who are interested in trying out new gadgets. Uh, it might not be the same people. I assume most Tesla owners can afford a gardener, but similar size. <laughs> yeah. Could you talk about the cost a little bit? How much uh, for the uh, buyer and then how much is it going to cost for you guys? Sure. Uh, so we think we can build this robot at about $700. Um, we're not 100% sure yet what we'll charge for the robot. We know that the service uh, is profitable easily, even if it's not autonomous at all, at $50 uh, a month. And we've run some surveys that suggest that people are willing to pay $50 a month. Um, so even before autonomy, we can run a profitable service for weeding. Uh, that number that I showed you earlier, the market number, for, let's see if I can get there, oops. The market number here for 15 billion, that's assuming we can sell a service at $10 a month. And we think we can get there, obviously not in the first iteration, but by iteration two or three, we can get relatively low cost. Just to add that, $700 price is for buying off the shelf hobbyist components. So actually, the price will go down versus that. Yeah, that, that's, our, that's our prototyping price, basically. We hope to be able to actually produce it at a much lower cost at scale. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, you guys. All right, next up. <laughs> there's their team. Next up, we have Arula. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Neelam Chakrabarty, and I'm the CEO of Arula. 
Arula helps K-12 parent-teacher organizations and parents like me become superheroes in their child's education. A few years ago, actually two, I took up a job that turned out to be one of the best and one of the worst jobs of my career. I volunteered to become a PTA president at my daughter's school, and I had a lot of fun. You know, I realized there was this world that existed, even in Silicon Valley, that was in 19th century, because we used pen, paper, pencil, and antiquated tools to manage funds of as large as $250,000. We recruited volunteers by using Google Docs, and we were under tremendous pressure to raise a lot of money because we were, you know, not getting money from anywhere else. There were huge budget cuts all across the board. And the reason being we were using band-aids all across, you know, using all these different hodgepodge of disconnected tools that didn't talk to each other. So we decided to do something, and I started building Arula. Arula is a unified platform that helps PTOs and parents be more engaged because it provides them all the tools in one place. PTOs can communicate with the parents, they can raise funds, they can um, coordinate and schedule volunteer time all in one place. What you see highlighted is something that we have in the MVP and the rest is part of our product roadmap. Now, we believe we have a unique business model here because currently we are really building that symbiotic relationship with the PTOs by giving them the free tools and then uh, they are helping us acquire a large parent audience because later when we have that critical mass of parents, we will build a marketplace of K-12 services such as tutors, after-school programs, uh, college counselor, and whatnot, which is a $65 billion market opportunities. Our competitors, even though, though they have similar platform to ours, they are actually monetizing by charging a hefty subscription fee to the PTOs or throwing annoying ads at them. So this is what a model would look like when we go to market, charging a 20% transaction fee on an average transaction size of $250. We believe we are the team to do it because we have extensive experience in building marketplaces and with small businesses throughout startups and working at companies like Intuit and um, Amazon. Thank you. Could, could you describe the user experience a little bit? Is it going to sort of, will you have your own interface that the user will live in, or will it be the other products? Yeah, so currently we are building a basic infrastructure or a platform which is our own IP and then bringing in some of the tools that really don't exist out there, like they don't have good APIs, for example, volunteer management and recruitment. But then we also pull into, um, plan to pull in other integrations via Google Docs, Dropbox, and other popular tools that they currently uh, are already using, so there is less friction there. So what's the main problem uh, you're addressing as your initial hook? Is it fundraising, or are there other functionalities? Uh, actually, lots of different problems. Um, they are all related, because what they're doing, as I mentioned, they're using these different tools. So they're asking parents, hey, you know what, parents, go to this website and fill up the form. Go to this website and make a payment. And then come to our school and then turn in the form. So it becomes very difficult for parents to really do all those things. And they're like, you know what, I'm not interested in doing donating money or time, because you you're making it too difficult for me. So we are really trying to become that one-stop destination where the PTOs will be able to do everything. Think about it like Slack. It's like a collaboration platform, but then you can you know, share documents, you can you know, manage your events and things like that. That's what it is. So you mentioned Slack. Imagine for a second that Slack looks at this space and decides to offer similar solutions. What, what is the added advantage of using your platform and your your product capabilities that let's say the likes of a Slack or any of the other players could not do and how do you believe you could acquire uh, additional PTO communities, parent PTA communities yeah. uh, and, and grow across the country? Uh, so basically, I mean, our platform is centered around schools. So what we have is a school-based private communities. It is not generic. I mean, 
PTOs and parents are using Facebook, but they are not getting any value of it because it is not built around their schools. It is not private. So that is our IP. But then we also have these uh, secret sauce where we are allowing parents and members not only from their own school community, but other school districts to communicate as well. And Slack is, again, they could have used Slack, but it is not built for their conversations. You cannot choose a conversation and say, hey, share it with grade two. Or you cannot choose a conversation and say, share it with this school. So we are very um, personalized and customized around that. Thank you. Here at Launch, we, we benefit a lot from a lot of the, the world-class classes and courses run by the university, both at Haas uh, and in other faculties. And uh, two of those are the lean, Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad class and Jorge Calderon's Social Lean Launchpad class. These... <laughs> And Jorge is one of our launch uh, faculty advisors. Um, these are perfect feeders into launch because they take uh, teams of students from the idea to uh, their minimum viable product. And we go from the minimum viable product uh, through iterating the business model to make teams scalable and fundable. So the next team tonight, Inner Waste, uh, started in Jorge's social lean launchpad class in the fall. And they came to us. Uh, and I'm very pleased to present them, uh, to introduce them here tonight. In a waste. Hi, everyone. My name is Elin Pei, and today I'm going to talk to you about recycling. This is Leonakis, a small business in the Bay Area with about 100 people. It pays about $600 per month in recycling costs. Maybe you don't think that's a lot, but that's about 15% of its operating costs. Recycling, business recycling in the United States is expensive, inflexible, and inconvenient. And the reason why that's the case is because for the past decades, big companies like Waste Management has been dominating this market, and they're acting like monopolies, and that's, that's a result, there's little innovation. On the other hand, there's more than 6 million contract workers who are underemployed in the United States, making less than $30,000 a year for some of them. Can we help them? Introducing Inner Waste, a two-sided platform that connects the businesses with the contract workers to perform recycling, recycling services. How does it work? A business simply have to use our app, and they can schedule services directly on our platform, and then we will pay contract workers in our system directly, where the contract workers then take the recyclables to recycling centers to redeem additional money. In addition to saving businesses significant money, we're also very easy to use. We, um, we also have a tracking dashboard. And finally, we provide social impact for both the businesses and the recycling workers. In talking with the businesses, they really think this is something they can use for marketing, and that's a big draw as well. So how does this, word, uh, this model work? And is it going to be successful? Well, we've already tested with our pilot uh, with a Nestle campus, which is uh, on College Avenue here in Oakland. They have about 200 people in their office, and they were really excited to do this pilot with us. In one month's time frame, we did biweekly pickups, myself and also through higher contract workers. We were able to save them 40% out of their, off of their recycling bill, and uh, that's a 50% gross margin, and they're, re they're ready to pay us today. Next steps, we, are, we already have signed up with two pilots in the Bay Area, and uh, we are going to reach a target of 1.5 million revenue by the end one year time frame with profit. And most importantly, that's $800,000 of recyclers of contract worker income, which we're going to generate. I'm the founder of Inner Waste with six years of experience in sustainability, a previous founder of a profitable company, and also a Haas MBA. And I am looking for people to join my team, and I'm also in the process of raising funds. If you like what I said, so come talk to me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is there something you know, unique about the labor pool that you know, recyclers have a particular problem? Is there something unique about the labor pool that makes recycling difficult to recruit for? And do you see the app applying to other categories as well, or the service applying to other categories? Uh, so are you just talking about just me recycling contract workers? 
or um, I mean, actually, it's been very easy to recruit them. Uh, you know, when I posted ads on Craigslist, we got overwhelming responses. Uh, we pay them basically at least $20 an hour, and when they redeem the recyclables, they make $30 for just the one pickup, which sometimes usually takes less than an hour. So actually, they're more attracted to our services than anybody else's. I don't know if that answers your question. What, why is that? Because first of all, it's the payment, and second of all, uh, the stuff that the recycling pickups are actually very clean because we source separate. We actually provide custom beans to our customers. So for instance, if a business like Nestle, they have 80% cardboard, we're providing custom bean like I've shown there, where uh, they actually go and pick up just cardboard, and that's very easy to transport. And this custom, these contract workers also, um, they usually would not work for companies like Uber and Lyft because they have a truck and they're, you know, they're electricians, so they're not gonna be able to pick up customers there. Explain a little bit more the revenue flow. Uh, you mentioned a couple of them, you know, the recycling uh, fees, I guess, and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and do you is is all the recycling revenue uh, only uh, for the driver or the contractor, so, is, or do you get some of that too? So I make the revenue from businesses paying me. So basically they would pay me monthly for the service I provide or one time fee if it's on demand. Uh, so for instance, Nestle, they pay, they used to pay $1,200 to the waste management and they pay me 800. So 800 is revenue I make and I give 400 of that to the contract workers. So that's a 50% gross. Yeah. Thank you. So passing out samples, another exciting uh, tasting opportunity is the last team in this group, Pop Oats. Hi there, we're Pop Oats. We are two oat entrepreneurs who are introducing <laughs> a first of a kind, we're introducing a first of its kind oat snack using our proprietary process to finally pop an oat. Uh, and so, uh, how many people here have had a snack today? A lot of you. We're turning into a snack nation. Over 94% of Americans are snacking daily, and yet still 60% are looking for healthier snack options. This is a huge reason why Better For You brands are growing three times as quickly as traditional ones. For example, here are two companies who took a still uh, segment of the snack market and then introduced a product that was consistent with these better for you trends. And they re were rewarded handsomely. Now, oats, to the fun part, are very similar to popcorn. They're a grain. But unlike popcorn, they haven't been popped. Instead, they're rolled, steel cut, and primarily eaten in the breakfast category until now. It wasn't easy, but with the help of the USDA and 1,000 pounds of oats, we developed a process that created a remarkably crunchy product. And we went outside the building and got a lot of customer feedback, hundreds of customers, and they said that Pop Oats reminded them mostly of nuts, popcorn, and seeds, which collectively account for over $5 billion of the salty snack category, which is a $32 billion market. Now, uh, so with that information, we decided to boldly go where no oat has gone before and launch oats from the breakfast world into the salty snack universe with flavors like barbecue, spicy nacho, and chili lime. We've got the team to take this product to the market. I call it our Hungry Pop Oats team. We have a partnership with the USDA that has a track record of successfully commercialized food technologies, and our advisor, Peter, has over four decades of industry experience. To date, we've sold successfully at local festivals with positive gross margins. If you hadn't had a chance to try us out at the exhibit table, don't worry, we're coming to a local grocer near you. Until then, come find us at popoats.com. Thanks. And we'll take questions. Can you talk a little bit more about your vision for the brand that you want to create? Yeah, so the brand Pop Oats, uh, we want it to be definitely in line, on trend, with all the, uh, essentially what consumers are looking for in the marketplace today. Uh, with all our interviews, people are looking for organic, non-GMO, gluten-free. Fortunately, oats are naturally non-GMO uh, non and gluten-free. It's only when they're processed with wheat that they get contaminated. So we're using, uh, whole grain, high fiber, and, and we're actually two times the protein content as popcorn, interestingly. So our brand is a, you know, a wholesome brand. 
Can you talk about the cost per bag, where you think you can price it? Sure. So right now, we actually produce at the USDA. We have positive margins. We've identified two pieces of equipment and cost an amount that will allow us to multiply our production 15-fold and nearly double our gross margins. Right now, our production costs on our kind of one to one and a half ounce size is about a buck 15 a unit. Uh, we expect to have that in retail for between two and three. We've successfully sold it for between 250 and three at events. Uh, we'd like to get it under two to allow, to allow a little broader adoption. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience getting into the retailer's shelves? So we're actually not in retail yet. We've sold at festivals. We've spoken to a number of re yeah, spoken to a number of retailers. They're eager to carry us. The ones we're talking to are local businesses, much themselves. Uh, Berkeley Bowl, Piedmont Grocery, Farmer Joe's, Buy Right. They generally support local businesses just as they are. Um, nice thing is, you know, oats have a positive connotation. They're they're known to be healthy, even though a lot of people don't quite know why. And so we expect that, you know, we've got a lot of feedback for getting in the store. We don't just want to get there, we want to stay in there. So that's why we're fine-tuning our product market fit. So when we get in the stores, we can continue to increase our volumes. So I, I know what a bag of granola is because I've had granola before, but a lot of people haven't had oats. So, and maybe they have, but they just don't know it. So speaking to the brand strategy, how do you move beyond and transcend this new type of snack? I mean, crave jerky is jerky, it's beef jerky. So how, how do you transcend that, that educational um, issue or friction? So fortunately, a lot of people already eat oats. They're, you know, they're, they're, have, they're a fixture of the breakfast world. So it doesn't take much to, you know, from the people we've spoken to, no, no, north of 500 people, to, to eat it in the afternoon arena, eat it in savory. Our savory flavors that you're trying perform three to one over our sweet flavors. People were eager to have a savory option. We got a lot of feedback that I love to eat this at three in the afternoon, something to hold myself over. The fact that no savory oat product exists in a $32 billion market, we believe allows an opportunity for us, considering we have proprietary IP. We have four startups left to pitch. I hope you've all voted and you're all enjoying the evening. Another MBA team from Jorge Calderon's Social Lean Launchpad class, Wheel the World. Hello, do you hear me? Hello. Hello, I'm Alvaro, I'm co-founder of Wheel the World. And since I'm a kid, I've been always passionate about exploring the outdoors with friends. And uh, only six months ago, my good friend Camilo, he proposed me a, an idea of going to Patagonia and explore the W Trek uh, in the mountains of Patagonia, of course, very inaccessible. Saying that I was always exp uh, ex um, excited about exploring the outdoors, obviously it's not easy when you're in a wheelchair because uh, of these places are not accessible. So when we decided to do this trip, uh, we, re we realized that it was a big challenge. We had to organize a lot of, of things. First, we needed a, a special equipment. So we did a crowdfunding campaign to acquire this, this equipment and then live in the park so other people with disabilities can use the, the, the equipment in the, in, the, in the park. Not only that, we partnered with sponsors and one of them was a local operator that, he, that they committed to, uh, to receive the other travelers after us uh, and, and give them the same ad, uh, experience that we would have. The experience that we, we, we had in the trip was amazing, not only for me, but also for my friends. And the impact generated for our sponsor was huge by our, uh, by our viral content and also uh, about for, with the events that we organized uh, screening our documentary. That's why we decided to build an organization to, and also, sorry, also, uh, the social impact that we generated was even, even uh, stronger, as in only two months, already four people have explored the, the, the national park already, and for the next season, uh, all, there are more than 20 people interested in doing that, and we already have six reservations to use the chair and, and do the same trick that we did. That's why we decided to found Will the World, to enable places, uh, natural wonders around the world for people uh, with disabilities. We want to do this by partnering with local operators in the places that we want to enable, and uh, as a franchise model, in terms that 
we will partner with them. They will have the equipment, and they will provide it for the local, uh, for the travelers, and we will charge us a service fee for every traveler after us that we will do this adventure. At the same time, we will uh, help them promoting uh, that programs with, with uh, media content. This is our goal. We want to have uh, Wilder World programs around the world. And uh, this year, we want to do, do two other programs, one in, in the most isolated place in the world, Easter, Easter Island, another one in Yosemite. We are Wilder World. We want to enable the, uh, natural wonders for everyone. Uh, come and join us. <laughs>
they're really unsafe, the way they deliver this genetic payload into cells, it has never really worked that well. So we thought several years ago, hey, what if we can have an engineering solution to this fundamental therapeutic problem? So I've got this credit card. Now, all of you guys carry credit card. So we are developing the silicon chip technology that will be the size of this card that will have parallel arrays of little tiny nano needles. They're all, you know, size 1,000 times smaller than your hair diameter. They're all individually controlled. You coat them with the drug compounds and then puncture to the cell. It's like sticking a needle to a jelly. You take the cells outside the body, and that's how you do that. They're safer, they're versatile, and they're targeted. Now, this is a really big market. We, starting to, we, we start with the R&D market because there is no FDA involved. After that, we go after this big market, the cancer gene therapy. Then you've got Parkinson's, you've got Alzheimer's. You know, the opportunities are just really endless. So we have been doing hundreds of customer interviews, and one of the things that turns out is a stem cell transplant and therapy is really unsafe. Viruses just don't work. So we are targeting these guys to start with and before we go on further. Now, this is a really complex task, and we need some really smart people. Not only we have support from industry leaders, we've got support from Berkeley, Stanford, and the NSF. Thank you very much for your attention. Just elaborate where you are with your IP. So we actually own the core IP, and uh, we are, you know, doing a bunch of work at Stanford. And um, so we actually, uh, uh, you know, we just disclosed our technology to the Stanford OTL last week. Uh, but whatever IP builds on, it builds on this core IP that the company actually owns. You got patents. That's right. So we, ha so there are actually patents pending. So. Um, could could you? Clarify the manufacturing side, and then um, does each chip have to be custom for the patient or the application, or is it a standard product? So that's really good because, you know, we, we actually call ourselves like the Amazon. So the basically, it does not matter, for example, if you want to send a large parcel or small parcel to Wyoming or South Carolina or Shanghai, Amazon should be able to do that. So the reason we are developing this chip technology is to create this versatility into the system. Whether you want to deliver DNA or RNA molecules into plant cells or bacterial cells or human cells, one single platform can do that. All you have to do is change the surface chemistry. That's it. It's very simple. Well, what's the next big milestone, and what resources do you need in order to achieve that milestone? So we have been working on developing our bioprototype minimum viable product um, that we plan to start selling by the first quarter of 2018. And uh, we st we are expecting to have a stage two product completed by the end of 2018, which will be our sort of our first major product that will start selling to the R&D labs in biopharma companies and universities by the first or second quarter of 2019. So I think, and before we actually go on to target the clinical space, but I think for that, we have to partner with biopharma companies. So, you know, it's actually building a one step at a time. How do you do manufacturing? So it's basically CMOS semiconductor chip technology, sort of what you have in your cell phones, right? Um, that's why it's it's really a standard process. Uh, and it actually, uh, you can actually manufacture them at between 50 cents to a couple of dollars a chip. So the gross profit margin is really extraordinarily high. So it's beautiful. <laughs> well, be Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. We have one last team, and they're going to necessitate about 30 seconds of setup. Uh, so bear with us, and we'll have our final pitch from Necessito Doc. Guys, guys, as you know, we've got board meeting tomorrow, and I need all the materials by tonight. No excuses. Oh, man, I feel really sick. I need to see a doctor now. But it's going to take me at least three hours to go and come back. Dude, but why don't you use a new corporate benefit? It gives you immediate access to doctors and medicine delivery. Whoa, for real? That's amazing. <laughs> we created Nesitodoc in order to address Federico's need for immediate assistance. Nesitodoc is a technological platform optimizing healthcare resources in Mexico. 
we have a fully developed technological platform that connects patients and doctors through video consultations. We're a two-sided marketplace offering a solid value proposition for both patients and doctors. We have launched offering two basic services for a single price of $8 per, per consultation, primary care and nutrition. In terms of traction, we have this fully developed platform, have received over 6,000 visits, have offered 160 consultations. This month, we closed our first four corporate clients. We have a partnership with an online drugstore that enables us to deliver prescribed medicines all over Mexico, plus a partnership with a network of doctors that gives us uh, access to 150 doctors. In terms of market, we're focusing in Mexico. That is a rapidly growing market that is gonna reach 2.3 billion by 2021. Given our Spanish speaking nature, our total uh, target market today is 9 billion. We have a strong team that is ready to scale our company. Uh, it, we combined five na nationalities with diverse business backgrounds merged with medical and technological expertise. In addition, our team is supported by three MBAs with diverse and strong business backgrounds and an amazing launch mentor. Long-term growth is gonna be driven by international expansion and alternative monetization models. For the past months, we have addressed the uh, huge need that Hispanic, the Hispanic community in the US have for medical assistance that is being ignored by all the telemedicine peers here in the US. Thank you. And just for you to know, thanks to Necesito Doc, we were able to finish our job on time. <laughs> and now I'm feeling much better. Thanks. Will you focus mainly on um, healthcare institutions as the channel, so the um, providers versus payers versus direct-to-consumer? Great question. Uh, our go-to-market strategy considers a business-to-business -business model in Mexico that consists of selling packages of consultations to companies, so they offer them as benefit to their employees. We offer a solid value proposition for companies, allowing them to increase uh, employee motivation, increase uh, productivity, and lower expenses. Um, can doctors make more on your platform? And if so, how many visits per day do they need to do? Yes, well, actually, we doctors are really happy with our service. Doctors uh, that work for the government, for example, do an average of less than $700 uh, a month. So they are constantly seeking for alternative, like income opportunities. They really like uh, our platform. It enables them to optimize their agenda. So every consultation is incremental revenue for them. Are there examples of this similar uh, to your model uh, being successful in other countries? Yeah, well, the, here in the US there's well, telemedicine is a really uh, mature industry that has been very successful. There's Teladoc, that is a publicly traded company. There's Doctor in Demand. There's plenty, American Well. That it's a proven business model here in the U.S. And they haven't gone to the Spanish-speaking no, countries. No, they're they're totally ignoring it. Why? We well, I, I guess they they don't have the the resources to to have access to Spanish-speaking doctors uh, and. Well, the telemedicine space is, in, is, is big enough for them. So we are targeting this totally ignored market. There's a huge need that is growing as we speak given the uh, political environment. So this, there's lots of people that are going to have less access to healthcare, and we are ready to address that. Thanks so much for your attention. Can we just give all of our teams one more round of applause? <laughs> What's going to happen now is that we ask that you engage our app one more time and vote on those final four teams. It's really important that all of our teams get your feedback. So please go ahead, open guidebook, and vote. 
Um, I know what you're all wondering. You've all seen these fantastic teams. They've all been through the launch program, and you're thinking, what next? Where are they going to go next? What do you do after you've been through, through launch? Up next, we have uh, Austin Walker, who is a founder of Innovane. Innov Innovane were a finalist in launch uh, 2016, just last year. They won the Audience Choice Award. They're now uh, in Y Combinator, and uh, Austin is, uh, is in Forbes 30 under 30 list for this year. Woo! Speaking to Austin tonight is our head of partnerships, Olga Ballard. So I'd like you to welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, so it was a great introduction. I, I want to add a little bit more about Innovane, but then I do have the co-founder and CEO sitting next to me. So do you want to just say a few words about what is Innovane? What was the idea last year? What is the company now? Yeah, so Innovane is a medical device company. We're focused on a problem that most people are unaware of, but impacts about 10% of the US population eventually. And what most people don't know are there are valves in your legs that get blood from your foot to your heart. And when those valves fail, uh, ultimately 10% of people get pain, swelling, and millions of people have these open wounds on their ankles. And there's no replacement valve on the market. And so we ha are building a first of its kind uh, valve to help those patients. Um, and does it feel different being in the room uh, in front of all these people and not having to pitch, but just sitting in a nice, comfortable chair? It's much nicer when you don't have to ask for money. So, I, I never have this problem. All I do is ask people for money, and you know, that's how we fund the program. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your background? You know, what were you doing before launch, and how did you come across the the program? Why did you decide to do it? Yeah. So, I was uh, in medical school uh, prior to starting Innovain. Um, I, in my fourth year, came across uh, a very inspiring. Uh, individual who's now my co-founder who's brought about 12 medical technologies to market um, and ultimately decided to put uh, pause on my medical training in order to co-found the company. And so I was in the UC system uh, and at that time my good friend Alex, who is now hiding, um, uh, was running a launch, launch program last year and so he encouraged me to apply. Fantastic. Um, when you went through the program, what did you think was the most valuable thing, takeaway for you that you maybe didn't know before and kind of launch opened up your eyes to it? Um, I would say the most valuable part of launch was definitely the mentorship. Uh, so there were several very high quality mentors that helped us. Um, Josh Langenthal, uh, Darren Cook, uh, Cliff Wright, uh, Rhonda and Andre obviously. So a, a number of very, uh, very helpful individuals. Fantastic. And then any unexpected discoveries during the program, personal or professional, where you were like, wow, this, this really is not something that I realized was happening? Um, I feel like that's every day for a startup. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, nothing in, in particular. Yeah. Great. Um, when you graduate from a program like this, uh, what did it feel like when you were in quote unquote real world afterwards? Yeah, so. Accelerators are nice because they give you a deadline to push your team with. Uh, and when you get out of an accelerator, you have to find other ways to uh, create deadlines for your team. Um, and so getting creative about that to make sure that people continue to hit, uh, to t hit timelines is uh, an important and uh, challenging problem to get over. Cool. And then any advice for you know our teams that pitch today, but also to any people in the audience who may be thinking about Starting a startup, what are the questions you ask yourself before you really dive into the deep end? Um, I think the biggest thing is that people always ask themselves questions. Are they, are they ready? Um, how can I better train for this? Should I get X job so I can be qualified to do Y? Um, and I think the biggest thing is that I would encourage is that uh, you just need to jump in and do it. Um, I had zero background in business, period. I was in medical training my whole career. Um, and you just get good mentors, good advisors, surround yourself with smart people, and, uh, and you figure it out. Great. And I was sort of thinking, uh, as we we're talking, how important is it to have momentum? You know, you clearly on a great streak right now with you know, the company winning so many accolades, you yourself personally being 
quite prominent and mentioned in the media, including Forbes, which I think is amazingly impressive. Um, how does it actually help, or does it detract from focusing on your startup? Uh, Traction is critical. Okay. Um, I mean, so you obviously have to be careful to not get uh, to suck your kind of R and D or whatever your kind of core focus is from that. Um, but in terms of building marketability, uh, getting investor interest, uh, being able to recruit uh, top talent, having ways to objectively point to to success as opposed to just kind of internal R and D is is critical. Excellent. And then thinking about you know the rest of this year, beginning of next year, what are your startup goals? Yeah. So uh, we're a medical technology company. We're focused on R and D. Uh, intellectual property is the backing and, and value. Uh, proposition that we really bring to the table. Um, so we continue to uh, expand quite an extensive uh, IP portfolio. Uh, we have uh, very strong animal trials going on currently. And our biggest goal is basically to push forward to our first human trial. Cool. And, you know, when I was, before school, when I was in my job, I probably spent, you know, 12 to 16 hours together with my coworkers. What's an average day with your coworkers? Does it ever end? Um, well, while I may like to, uh, to never see certain work end, you need to obviously make sure that your team is uh, balanced, because if you overwork them, obviously they can't work for years. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's, it's hard, but you have to make sure you strike that balance so you don't burn out your team. Super. Well, you know, I'd like to thank you for coming back to launch. One of the things that we really tried to focus this year is not only bringing together the teams that are in the cohort now, but also giving them an opportunity to meet teams from other years, and we had a bunch of networking events. So for any alumni that are in the audience now, you know, we always encourage you to come back, to join us for boot camps, to join us for happy hours especially. Uh, I think that's where both parties find most value. Um, and you know, we're really trying to, to build something that's lasting and connections that people can tap long after they've graduated from the program. So, you know, I'd like to thank you and um, hopefully our audience enjoyed your insight and you guys can catch Austin afterwards as well, hopefully. Um, so let's just put our hands together for Austin. Thank you, Austin, and thank you, Olga. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling right, like sitting in one of these amazing chairs it would be a pretty nice prize at this moment. Um, but we just have a few more moments while our judges are continuing to deliberate and to follow on the theme of uh, Olga's talk and the hard work that Olga and her team have done to maintain our partnerships this year. I'd like to share a little bit more about the, the sponsors who uh, have, as I mentioned, been providing both financial and uh, expert support throughout the year. Um, so I'll start with Goodwin. They are an international law firm uh, who have who have company or who have offices in Boston, Hong Kong, London, Silicon Valley, Washington D.C., and all over the world. Um, they not only are a law firm, but they are a law firm that specializes in helping startups, and they are quite innovative themselves. They actually have a program called the Founders Workbench, which is a first of its kind open source legal advisory resource that's designed to help early stage startups. And, they, and through that program, they offer free startup document creation capability. That's something we hear a lot of our teams um, looking for is legal support and legal services early on. And so Goodwin offers a really interesting tool that provides aspiring startups uh, the way to get started without going into too much crazy legal debt. Um, secondly, I really want to highlight, I already mentioned Glenn Ballard, who is one of our uh, key sponsors. He has supported us for many, many years. Um, and he is the head of Marpe, which as I mentioned, is a one-stop shop for all accounting, tax, valuation, and finance support for early stage startups. Um, Glenn is an amazing guy. He's been in Silicon Valley for a long time. He came to our mini boot camp and talked to teams about how to design um, a really effective financial model. And he also kind of has a different take on the world of Silicon Valley. It can really provide some truth um, to all the myths out there. So I really encourage anybody who is working on a startup who hasn't yet found the time to hire a CFO to reach out to Glenn. 
Um, he's actually right here. He can wave to us uh, and talk to him because he's a really great guy and has provided tons of support for launch. Um, we talked about TubeMogul earlier. They now, as Rob mentioned, have been acquired by Adobe, but they got their start right here uh, at launch. It was then a program called B-Plan, which was just a pitch night. Um, and they started uh, right here as Haas students and managed to grow the business to such a point that they were just acquired by Adobe for $500 million this year. Um, so really an incredible success story. We wish that for all of our launch teams, whether it's with their current business or uh, with, a future, with a future endeavor. Um, but anyhow, they have been an incredible support to us as well, and I think especially that alumni connection. Having gone through the program, they've been able to come back and provide not only sponsorship, but um, that human connection and insight and the school of hard knocks of being a founder. So we really appreciate their support. Um, next, I already mentioned um, Javelin. They, Noah was here on our judging panel. Um, he has also been a supporter of Launch for 10 years, uh, as we mentioned at the start of the program. Uh, Javelin Venture Partners, which Noah is part of, um, is an early stage venture capital firm specializing in technology-based startups, and they really help startups um, innovate, scale, and grow their businesses. And um, yes, we are very grateful to them as well. Another, another similar backer, we have a couple of other VCs that are also supporting Launch. B Partners is really active in the Berkeley community, in the Haas community in particular. I know we have a couple of launch team members who are actually going to work at B this summer, and a <laughs> launch team member from last year is actually going full-time at B. So they really are an incubator for not only startups, uh, or they're a supporter for startups, but also a su great supporter of the Haas community, and Haas is looking to get into VC. Um, Another supporter is Dow. They have been working with us for several years. Obviously, Dow, well known for science and technology and passionate innovation. And they have, um, yes, <laughs> leave it there. Uh, another sponsor for us is the NSF I Corps. Uh, we had Rhonda on stage earlier tonight. Uh, she is the, she helps facilitate the NSF I Corps program here at Haas. It's one of about 15 different hats that she wears. If you've, if you've ever talked to Rhonda Schrader, she really is just putting together the puzzle pieces at every moment to make entrepreneurs here at Berkeley as successful as they can. And the NSF I Corps program, um, which she helps facilitate here at Haas, uh, helps foster especially technology, entrepreneurship, and helps support us actually running the curriculum and provides funds for us to hire faculty to teach our startups. The last VC that I'll mention who is backing us is Pair VC. Uh, they are a seed stage VC as well, and they really support the Berkeley community through their Berkeley Entrepreneurship Challenge. If you're a Berkeley student uh, or alumni who's working on a Berkeley, or who is working on a startup right now, you should really reach out to Pair VC. Uh, this year, they just gave away a quarter of a million dollars to a Berkeley startup to try to help really launch them into success. And the engagement that Pair has shown to the Berkeley community is really valuable. And we, of course, really value their support and the insight that they gave our teams at our first boot camp. Um, the last two sponsors that I'll talk about are first plug and play ventures. We already mentioned one of the prizes that our judges are deliberating over right now uh, is the plug and play ventures prize, which will actually give one of our startups the chance to spend three months in the plug and play uh, accelerator in Silicon Valley. And that will be a really great way for our teams to continue to grow, get exposure to a broad network of mentors, and continue to facilitate connections. Trinet is another partner who has come alongside Launch to provide support to our program and to provide support to our teams. They're a cloud-based professional employer organization for small and medium-sized businesses, so they really help with HR and hiring, um, and they have been very supportive of our team this year. In, in particular, they administer payroll and health benefits, and they advise clients on employment law compliance and risk reduction. And um, that is 
our full list of sponsors. So if you are a sponsor right now, uh, who is in the room right now, excuse me, if you would be willing to stand up so we can give you one more round of applause for all the support that you have provided. We have other groups of people in the room tonight who uh, also deserve, deserve an awful lot of thanks for all the hard work they've put in to help these teams uh, get where they are uh, this evening. So firstly, I'd like to uh, mention our three faculty members who deliver all the curriculum uh, to these teams. They go through five uh, bi-weekly we webinars uh, with these faculty, uh, and they get a, an awful lot of advice from e real experts in the Lean Launchpad methodology. So um, I can't see them in the room, but we have <laughs> Jorge Calderon, who, as I said before, runs the Social Lean Launchpad program. We have Andre Marquis, uh, and we have Rhonda, Rhonda Schrader, who is um, executive director at the Berkeley House Entrepreneurship Program uh, and is running a course next term called Lean, uh, Lean Transfer, which looks to take Berkeley's I IP uh, and pair that up with engineers and business students, uh, put it through the Lean Launchpad methodology, and hopefully produce something valuable at the end. So if you could all just give a quick round of applause uh, to those three. <laughs> Secondly, uh, when, when teams start the program, uh, they are paired with a, a mentor. This is somebody from industry who has a wealth of expertise in, in their area. Maybe um, it might be a technology platform or, or medical expertise, or they've worked in the food industry for many years. Uh, so we've, we have a, a community of mentors. Um, some have worked with teams in the past, uh, and uh, some had the pleasure of working with our teams uh, this year. We're trying to build a big community so that uh, as we accept new teams every year, we can match them with the very, be very best person who can provide the very best uh, advice. I know some of them are, are in the audience, so can any of them put their hands up and say they're here? Cool. <laughs> We really, our teams really couldn't achieve what they've done without, without your help, and we really hope that you stay in touch and you stay involved with Launch and come back next year. All right, welcome back. Welcome back, judges. Can we get a little bit of quiet for our grand, pri or for our prize announcements? Okay, so as I said earlier, the first prize we're going to award this evening is uh, it is from our partners at Plug and Play. This is three months in their startup program uh, with all the benefits uh, they provide. Uh, and it's, got, it's uh, in kind, it's worth 150K. So could I have one of the judge volunteers to come up to the stage and announce the winner? <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, the winner of Plug and Play, all three. Or just one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you said. It is just, just plug and play. Nobody knows. <laughs> um, I believe it is Coco. <laughs> that was almost an Oscar moment, but not. <laughs> Handshake. 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 Yeah. Thank you to all of you for participating in our audience vo voting. It's very important to hear what the crowd has to say. So the next prize that we will announce is our Audience Choice Award. Can I get a judge volunteer to announce? All right, can I get a drum roll? <laughs> all right. The Audience Choice Award is a tasty snack. Pop Oats. <laughs> Congratulations. Congrats, you 
you guys. Very well done. And the tension continues to build. Next up, we will announce our runner-up. Can I get a judge volunteer? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mykonos. the uh, second prize that Mykonos has won this week. Earlier this week, they won Bear Trap, a, uh, <laughs> an innovative on-campus uh, shark tank experience. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, can I get a judge to come up and announce our final winner? Last but not least, I'm so excited to announce that Oishi has won our first place. Okay, you should get in. <laughs> I had to come all the way down from the back. <laughs> And, and finally, could we have all the launch startups uh, for 2017 down on the stage for one final congratulatory round of applause, round of applause and pleasure. <laughs>